a diplomat or spy would be a great way to America did truly believe the rest of the world. Obviously, South Korea was a challenge for them. It was funded by a Dutch company that needed someone that could speak to So you crossed the bridge. I crossed the bridge. You never looked back. Outside of Chicago, did not have a passport. So from diplomacy, espionage <laughs> to technology and IT. And invented with the philosophy, in the case of Microsoft, around... But how do I trust the output? Do I just take it? I mean, it's, it's going to have that black box element you don't understand. We're talking about executive sponsorship or playing the right politics with Some it? Some of the concerning uses of AI around upcoming elections. I think, are we doing enough to have our voice? Right? And I'm passionate about voting as an American abroad because... What do you see next for this industry? <laughs> Welcome to Brains Flood. <laughs> it has been amazing. Look, I've met you like in this really short term and I was wondering what can I write in my intro about Marcy and how I can present you uh, to the people, to the viewers. There's only one word that I could have add to your, okay. your title really. And I was tossing between being the amazing Marcella Larson <laughs> or the remarkable Marcella Larson. And I think both of them They'll fit you really well. Welcome to Brains Flat. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I can't wait for the questions that come from being amazing and remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're going to have an open discussion, and it's all about being authentic, about being different, about showing uh, to our viewers that there's another side of IT and technology, and there's the human side, the human factor. Um, and this is where we are. And how we created this idea, this vision about being the brains flat of the industry. So let, let's go back in time to where it all started, and the childhood, the neighborhood where you were raised, and especially your family and the influence of family on how you grew up. Wow, that's a, a huge question. <laughs> But I guess I would describe uh, my childhood as coming from that middle America, a point in time when most people in the community where I was born, outside of Chicago, did not have a passport. It could have been several generations of immigrants, predominantly Irish Catholics, Polish, Slovenian, but few people left that community. And... Um, my parents were bold enough, probably around age eight, to move overseas. And my mom even bolder because we moved to a country she had never been to before, which was Australia. Oh, my I God. All the way from the States <laughs> to Australia. Uh, and I remember as a kid realizing at that time we were going against a lot of the society norms. A lot of people were not understanding why would you move so far away in the world. Uh, they couldn't understand why you would leave the great nation of America, because I think at that time, America did truly believe the rest of the world doesn't exist or needed their help. Uh, and uh, maybe not as much curiosity around the rest of the world. And probably the average person didn't really understand how a plan to discover the world and move other places would happen, at least not in middle-class America. <laughs> Do you still remember the time when you left? Was it an emotional goodbye? And like, well, vividly, yeah. it was actually really cool because my parents told me probably about 18 months before, but it was our family secret. So we were planning for this, but they wanted to keep uh, the news about this kind of internal to share it before we're leaving. Yeah. And uh, I would ask a lot of questions at school, any topic we were learning. Are there a lot of earthquakes in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> to the point of, I think at the parent teacher meeting, the teachers were like, what's going on with the questions? <laughs> but I thought it was pretty cool to be on this insider plan with my parents. But I could be, I could see the stress it put on them. And I basically had no idea of what it would feel like to actually leave that security behind, to leave your friendships behind, to be that new and different kid that 
didn't really enter my mind mm -hmm. <laughs> until we arrived. <laughs> so I would say I was very excited about the prospect. I was kind of excited that other people didn't understand why we would do that plan. Kind of an insider thing with your family. Mm -hmm. And then school? So you came here and you started school in Australia? I started school and I realized things were different. I felt like I went back in time to the description I had heard from my parents' life about going to strict Catholic schools, wearing uniforms. <laughs> um, there were, at one point at one of my schools, you weren't actually even allowed to talk during lunch until the bell rang. Yep. Uh, which was quite a significant contrast coming from the U.S. But, yeah, I had my ups and downs. I hated being teased about my accent. I think I made a conscious effort to fit in at times. But then other times I realized, hmm, it's kind of cool to be from someplace different. And how did you manage to keep your accent all these years? Well, I'm not sure I did at all times. We can ask some of my friends from my childhood here. Uh, but I moved back to the U.S. Oh, okay. around year 11, and it just became too difficult to explain Australia, where I was from. I just sort of gave in and tried just to... Just blended in again. <laughs> it's too yeah. hard. <laughs> it's too hard. So I think things came to life for me going to university because you're in a much different environment, a variety of students and teachers... And that global thinking really came into mm. play. So that was a great highlight of my life. So what did you do in uni? Well, I was always attracted towards something international. As you gave away in the preview, yeah. I thought a diplomat or spy would be a great way to travel the world. <laughs> and early exposure to things like international trade. Even as a, a young kid in school, my parents kind of exposed me to things in that area. Being from Australia, we learned a lot about exports of iron ore. I don't know, it sounds boring, <laughs> but I knew there was something interesting that would allow me to travel from that. So I focused on that for my studies and I was surrounded more by girls of my sorority or in the Greek system that probably actually weren't studying that for the most part, except for a couple of my friends. So a bit of an anomaly there, but ended up changing universities to focus more deeply there and really met a great group of people to found this organization called ISIC, mm -hmm. who raids traineeships around the world. And we managed to raise a number of them with Nike. And we had a plethora so that we could all go somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what basically took me into my first role in South Korea as the first uh, ISIC trainee ever to go there. I figured it was better than staying in the U.S. and, and starting an entry-level role. You either go to Australia or South Korea, you couldn't just go to Europe or any other places? Well, I think when I had my sights set on getting this traineeship, that the original goal was to go to Spain or Latin America, oh, yeah. because that was my specialization and my language. Unfortunately for me, I just didn't get a match. I got a match with a role that would leverage my language skills that was funded by a Dutch company that needed someone that could speak English also in uh, their joint venture mm -hmm. in South Korea. And they were just uh, starting uh, to do a joint venture in Mexico. So they basically needed someone to help them understand what was going on there yeah. uh, and help with a lot of the coordination between imports, the export, the tariff, the duties, the communications. So they figured, hey, we can get one of these interns. The Dutch company probably knew about that program since they were in Europe and gave the funding to the Korean company to effectively bring someone on board. Excellent. Obviously, South Korea was a challenge for you at a young age. Yeah. Was it a struggle or was it like, did you all also fit in properly in South Korea? And I absolutely did not fit in. <laughs> we're talking a place in the world at that time that had a non-convertible currency. So it was even tough to deal with U.S. dollars. And 
most Koreans actually couldn't even get a passport to travel outside of Korea until about two years before I moved there. So even for the general population, they wouldn't have had a lot of exposure to Westerners. And there were not a lot of Westerners in the country at that time. Maybe the common thinking would be you're an English teacher. Yeah. But if you were just around Seoul, you wouldn't come across many foreigners unless maybe there were U.S. Army. That would be the exception. So definitely there were a lot of instances with language challenges, cultural clashes. <laughs> I, I think as a young person, I really didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> I'd been to Singapore as a kid and I thought, okay, it might be like that. And I've seen a number of MASH episodes. I'm up for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the benefit of being willing to take a risk you don't know what you don't know. And at that time, it wasn't a great time to be coming out of university. The reality was a lot of my peers were just having to go back into hospitality or working in a call center. And everyone had set their sights high on these amazing roles, but they just weren't out there. Mm. So I knew... Reality was different. Yeah. yeah. This is going to give me a great experience. and. If I don't like it, I can always come back. That's correct. So from diplomacy, espionage, <laughs> international trading, yeah. all this big stuff to technology and IT. Well, I grew to love technology because of that experience. I do remember in university, and, and one of my good friends will tell you how she had to help me immensely with my computer <laughs> class, and other people were typing my assignments. <laughs> And there was one point when my dad really made Are you going to gonna thank him now? Because <laughs> this is your chance. They, they actually <laughs> laugh at me today that I ended up in tech. But I was charged with buying laptops and bringing a number of things over to the Korean office. Mm -hmm. And it was a six-day work week there because the whole country was on a program for growth. And the internet was just evolving. So I really helped the office to get set up with technology and learned myself along the way. Yeah. I struck up a relationship with the local Microsoft office, but being able to use email, moving away from fax, getting the team set up to use laptops, changing the way they work. I actually grew to really love it. It's good. And we could have real-time communication. Um, before I arrived on the scene, it was pretty much doing facts back and forth. Yeah. Uh, so it was kind of exciting for me. And since I didn't know anyone, I would actually spend hours even in the office learning, learning. about the technology to be able to help uh, with using it in our everyday work. And I became an experiment for one of the large companies that was starting to offer internet services. And we had to dial into Japan uh, through the modem to be able to use the email. But they actually gave us basically free credit to do it because they just did not have a lot of early adopters yeah. in the country at that time. But Korea was an early adopter of tech, so it almost grew like a wave when I was there. You could see it happen. It still is. Like, I think it's one of the best countries for adopting technology. They truly leapfrog yeah. because a lot of the constraints, they were able to leapfrog into newer tech, especially mobile, which yes. came even after I was there. They're a leader in that space for sure. So from there on, your journey started with Microsoft. Yeah. And you went into this Microsoft bubble for many, many, many years. Maybe one could say too many years, but I had many different chapters there. That's good. Was it? How was your experience overall? I think it was pretty incredible, especially having time to reflect. I left about uh, 16, 17 months ago. And when we hear a lot about stories within the IT industry, I actually think... I arrived on the scene in a new industry invented in our times and invented with the philosophy, in the case of Microsoft, around diversity, around supporting that curiosity for learning, removing hierarchy. What I didn't realize, I had my short experience in Korea and lots of cultural clashes in a very hierarchical, male-dominated society. <laughs> 
is just how lucky I was yeah. because I had not had the experience in working with traditional companies there. I do believe I took advantage of every opportunity there to benefit from that openness, benefit from that learning. And I do feel blessed that that's where I started my career in tech at Microsoft. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. So you were specializing specifically in the retail industry and that was your focus mainly. Not, not really until not, later. Yeah. So that early chapter took my skill set from Korea mm -hmm. and effectively uh, in-depth knowledge around trade agreements and tariff and, and duty and how goods pass through the border as a competitive advantage. Yeah. And I entered early on more in the supply chain and operations uh -huh. at Microsoft and thinking through how the technology can play a role there because Microsoft had challenges as well, cross-border trade. How do you tax and duty software? Yeah. How do you procure hardware and manufacture it in places like Mexico where there are specific trade agreements? Mm. But a number of requirements need to be in place as well to leverage those and get goods through the border. So I was in a role for several years of helping to find those standards, helping to educate, even working with the governments around challenges with duty and tax and securing customs rulings in many cases with global significance to help remove friction from that trade mm -hmm. and to use technology to have that visibility and data to look at the goods crossing the border. But I realized too, I'm in a tech company. Now I'm using tech in how I do my work, but this is a small team and the core competency of this company is product, it's engineering, it's sales and marketing. Those people are having a lot of fun over there. They're getting to travel the world. <laughs> so you're on the sideline so waiting I'm for your turn. I would love to be in that part of the company, but I'm here in tax and duty and operations. I've never seen anyone cross that threshold, but I managed to do it. So you crossed the bridge. bridge. You never looked back, yeah? After I, crossing or you did? I had my months of regret because I did love spending time in Latin America. I was in the Latin American division and I wasn't doing that worldly travel anymore. Yeah. But I found that my skills and my passions were very well with marketing and pro ultimately product management. And I spent a good stint in my career there. Everything from product management of middleware products like BizTalk server into the data and the AI space, dev tools for a while. But I think the common thread there was how do you take complex backend products that aren't very well understood by the business mm -hmm. and bring them to market and orchestrate the partners that deliver these, how you're messaging to the technical communities and those decision makers. But, but, breaking through so that the business also understands the relevance. And I loved that. I love being able to break down those barriers in simple and concise language for the business as well. Mm -hmm. And also the opportunity to take that feedback uh, from the customers and change the way you go to market, change the product roadmap. Very exciting. It does really take me to a very interesting point. Taking feedback from our consumers or from our customers um, do we really take feedback or do we customize the feedback that we take? We just uh, isolate whatever we want versus what we don't actually want and act on them. Is it a personal choice or is it really what the market wants and we listen to the market? What was your experience yeah. in that? I think that's a good point. I Probably at that point with technology, you are able to capture and see the patterns. Yeah. I, I suppose you do have a vision of what you think you are going to filter through in a very disciplined business review process to put forward your observations. The difference is today that discipline around the data and how that's collected and being able to remove some of that subjectivity in sophisticated business systems, mm. if you're putting that in there, it would probably take out that bias to actually then feed back ultimately to engineering and in the business reviews, the patterns that are being seen in the systems. 
and then contrast that against what's being said through the business reviews in the field um, by the business leaders. Yeah. So I think today we're at that point. I think a bulk of my career, it would have been reliant on the data we're seeing and putting that subjective lens over it. Yeah. Uh, so a bit of gut feel and a bit of data, but a very well-oiled machine in terms of how they collect that data from the field, from the subsidiary, and then bring that up into the engineering teams. Yeah. So you, obviously you had to do your business case and you had to present it. You had to sell it internally from yeah. stakeholders. Yeah. How hard was it to just sell your ideas internally from a marketing or from a, a person who deals directly with the consumers to the people who lives behind the desk? Like they would think, no, we're doing the right thing. It doesn't matter. We're launching product. Even if sometimes the product you launch is what the market wants. So was it really challenging from your point of view to sell your ideas internally within a big corporate environment? I would say it depends and it would be some examples, but in terms of selling your ideas for budget, if you saw an opportunity in the market to go to market to reach the audience in a new and unique way, very good empowerment, mm. perhaps more than today to get that type of budget. And for a young person, really owning oftentimes the P&L for a business and the marketing plan and being empowered, it was pretty incredible then. I'm not sure it would be that easy to get the funding to be able to experiment and test and learn in that way. In terms of product features and functions or business case around integration challenges, the people who were very successful at that often had very good organization and agility, and they knew how to do the business case, where to go. Uh, and I think that being able to drill down and navigate through things like precision questioning. I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but being able to really hold your ground in your case, present it with data, I think you had a pretty fair shot, but it was always very important to have good executive sponsorship to get to the right people. So we're talking about executive sponsorship or playing the right politics within a big environment oh, or yeah. both? Maybe a combination of both. Mm -hmm. I like to think it wasn't as political as other organizations, but perhaps once you have some of that organizational agility, it's kind of naturally are in the flow and you, you know how to do it well. Uh, but to be able to get what you needed in the time you needed, oftentimes you were going to that business leader to get to the right group. And so you would ask for their sponsorship to get the meeting. But because it was a fairly flat organization, it it was pretty easy to do those things quite quickly. And then there was a real discipline around business reviews. So you could also kind of collectively have your asks ready to go on the next business review. Yeah. Or you knew yearly planning was several weeks. I think it's a lot more efficient now, but that was your strategic forum to really think about what you were asking for for the next mm. year. Did it help you like being a woman in this environment? Did it help you sell your ideas better yeah. or <laughs> would that open doors internally and externally as a woman in this industry? You know, I think at the time I didn't really recognize that. I didn't really think I have an advantage or a disadvantage necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think. So you didn't use it to your advantage. Or did you just... No, no, I don't think I actively thought about that. I think maybe I overprepared mm -hmm. because I knew the caliber of people that would be coming in with us, going after the same budget that needed to do uh, an incredible job in presenting their business plan would be tough. I, I didn't look at whether they were male or female um, or any diversity group mm. actually at the time. Um, probably only started reflecting on that later in my career, to be honest. You have been successful for many, many years. Uh, there's another side is your family, your kids. How challenging was it to, to keep a balance between your working life and your family life? 
I think I took it day by day. I would say now I do often struggle with maybe some regrets when I wasn't there for my daughters, probably in some key years in high school in particular, because kids aren't really asking for the help they need. So what did you used to do? Just ignore it because I'm too busy, I haven't got time, and then my priority are somewhere else? Well, maybe my story was, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, that they didn't feel that they had the time just to ask for some help when yep. they needed it. But I think I always thought, there'll be time, I just need to get this done. I would there'll catch up with them, oh. yeah, yeah. So that time passes quickly, so... Perhaps to answer your earlier question, this constant need to be overprepared. Um, maybe I should have set my boundaries better and, and spent more time with my family and reflection. So what's your advice now for like the new generation going into this IT industry overall? Because I know it's, it is a very demanding industry. Um, what do you advise? Well, I think follow your passions. Don't assume that you have to be in a deeply technical role, as, as we were discussing getting ready for this. There's many roles in tech. If you do understand the technology and products, you definitely have a strategic advantage, but you can bring the art and science together in many roles. Uh, and look for that manager you're going to learn from in that team. Ultimately, it's not your role. It's who you're working with and who you're working for basically the team you're on, that's going to drive your satisfaction and your happiness. Did you always trust your team, by the way? Like, or was it some stage you, you were doubting yourself and your team? Can we deliver? Are they on the same wavelength? Like, I think I've always trusted my manager. I've been very fortunate in that way. And that's why when I answered your question about, did I feel a certain way about being a female? It may be shocking to say I had it pretty good, but I had it pretty good because I got lucky with great managers. But I have certainly had struggles on the team, people not pulling their weight or behavior not representative of a positive team. But in the end, I think the management and the values of the corporation could see dysfunction and it was corrected. So... I always took the long-term play because I have a lot of grit yep. and held true to my values. Just focus on the role, focus on the role. And generally the situation did change and good leadership was put in place and the challenges around me were dealt with. Yeah. Look, I always read um, like I've read books and statements and, you know, like everyone posts stuff on what is a good manager? What is really a good manager? What makes a person a really good manager? From your point of view, again. Yeah. Well, I think number one, I love when they challenge the team, but they empower you. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means no micromanagement for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> but being able to step in and almost like a therapist, like they know that talent and skill is in you and how they get you to see that. That is a great manager. That manager who looks at the team and has a diverse team and brings everyone together and they bring out the best in everyone. And the willingness to test and learn and know sometimes the team's going to make mistakes, but the team needs to find that together. Uh, and I think you want a manager that's aspirational too. Like um, you want someone that holds you to a higher bar and holds themselves to a higher bar. Mm -hmm. That, that builds a great team. And oftentimes that can be that manager who sets that work-life balance because that is great posturing for the team, right? To your earlier question, how do you get an environment where you don't give up your passions in life and you do spend enough time in your family? A lot of that's reflected in the team that you're doing and the manager you're working for. Yep. Yeah, 100%. So going back to technology, you have seen or you have did really watch and experience the evolution of this industry through many years now. Um, recently, we've been through the cloud migration and then cybersecurity suddenly came and knocking on everyone's door. 
uh, although it has been um, in the background for many, many years, and every single network administrator would know exactly what I'm talking about now. Um, but AI, oh my God, we started panicking. So what is AI? Um, what do we do with it? What is your view on AI? Well, firstly, AI has been around for a number of years. This is not a new concept. And AI is not possible for us to reap the benefits from without significant amount of data. So the most significant change really in our lifetime probably did happen a year ago with the release of ChatGPT, with generative AI and large language models of empowering us all with the power of artificial intelligence. So now we can access the world's data in our day-to-day -day experience, um, being able to be a consumer and leverage this technology. And now we want it in the workplace. So I think the possibilities of AI and machine learning, they've been there for a long time. It's been baked into a lot of the products we use every day. But now with generative AI, more human-like possibilities, being able to summarize information and do things, create marketing briefs, create images. These are possibilities we just didn't really know. You know, 14 months ago, this really didn't exist in mainstream for us. So we're at a tipping point. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing the productivity gains in some ways in our personal lives experimenting with that and and we're almost demanding coming back into the workplace like we want to be able to use this in our work and organizations also need to make sure that they have the guardrails in place to make sure this is governed this is secure this is being used in the right way we're not going to let our own data leak and be training others <laughs> large language yeah. models so we're at a really interesting point in history right now and i think for anyone listening there's an incredible amount of opportunity for new careers around this. Do you think um, AI will make us smarter or a bit lazier? Well, I think it has the possibilities for both. We can. What's a tendency? <laughs> <laughs> we can live in our own echo chambers, which we've seen happening with social media, right? We see a lot of the polarization and how people are thinking because they're constantly being fed by their own thoughts. Like, how do you get outside of your zone to have counter views, right? To consider that. I think we're going to find the same with AI. We have to make sure a variety of data is feeding this. But then we also have to make sure the data is protected and secure. And correct. And correct, yeah. So I think there's a danger with um, the outputs being limited by the echo chamber it could be in. Uh, but then there's incredible possibilities for productivity or even creativity with using it as a tool. So if you can take away some of the manual processes within, let's say, a more creative role, Imagine the possibilities because you can spend more time on the unique creativity of your role. Yep. Marketing, as I said, that's a great example. Like the route um, every day of like filling out a marketing brief. Maybe it learns a lot about what you need for the campaign and it fills that out. And you can spend a lot more time in thought. Drinking about coffees. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, every person in your company could become a marketer because yep. the guardrails can be in place. So, if the team in HR or sales are running some little mini marketing or social campaigns, they're using the approved images. They're yep. using the voice and tone of the organization. Now suddenly you have a team of 50 authentic marketers versus five in your organization. So I think there are incredible possibilities, but deliberate thought and training and skilling needs to go into that. And governments need to work together to make sure privacy, security, ethics are all considered along the way. Okay. So did you believe the regulations would be, would be followed up internationally on in AI, like what Europe is trying just to enforce regulations on and limit of use is just by... Well, I think in 
things are going in a good direction. This is all playing out in real time right now. I think Australia is in a very unique space to learn from the rest of the world yep. and show leadership. We've had some great leadership here in terms of privacy that have changed things globally. Uh, and this is not something one country can do in isolation. Oh, yeah, this, definitely, this 100%. Requires, you know, a global cooperation, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So when, when you put... Um, Personally, I trust myself when I put my input in AI and in Marvel. But how do I trust the output? Do I just take it for <laughs> granted and say, look, they're telling us the truth and this is the best outcome? Or should we doubt it? Should we analyze it before we publish whatever we're just using as a resource, as an outcome? I, w I would say that yeah. definitely you need to feel comfortable with your outputting and have those reviews in place. And to the best of your ability, understand those data sources. Yeah. I mean, it's it's going to have that black box element you don't understand. But if you're an organization, you do have control over your data and what you're feeding. And to have that understanding of what you're going to be putting out there, yeah. having those reviews in place is more important than ever. But there is a bit of black box with AI, yeah. right? I think we all understand as humans, we can look at patterns and we can make subjective decisions. But oftentimes what the AI is outputting, you know, through machine learning, we've even seen that is more accurate mm. than what we as humans would be recommending. But I think there needs to be a review process. Yeah, sure. no, 100%. So if... Um... I don't know if um, Marcella Larson had this opportunity to use AI, I don't know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, where would you be now? Well, one, I'd want to be an early adopter so I could get ahead of the <laughs> But two, I have to share with you what we have now wouldn't have been possible because we didn't have cloud computing. We didn't have a way to consume that data. We didn't have large language models. But if we did... Maybe I would have been more involved with thinking about AI for good, how we can use AI to avoid some of the challenges that we're facing in the world, sustainability, um, empowering everyone with greater understanding, making sure we get things right from the beginning, um, if that had been 20 years ago. So when you say get things right, what is right, what is wrong from your point of view? How can you classify <laughs> what's right? What's Potentially wrong? a lot more uh, early education about where things can go wrong. I think I shared earlier with you some use cases around using AI early on. Even Amazon was using AI to recommend where to offer free uh, prime delivery and then in the end, where they were offering overlaid on a U.S. map, you could see black zones of where it wasn't offered. And these zones were predominantly diverse, lower income Americans mm. and started to look like discrimination. But it was because it was built on machine learning, making those recommendations. And it didn't have that review process to go in and think about the implications of whoa, wait a minute here. It looks like we're offering free shipping only to wealthier households. Mm -hmm. That's, And I think there's a lot more thinking about that today. It takes some test and learn. So if we started 20 years ago, maybe we could have avoided a lot of challenging situations we're seeing today with social media, with mental health, with some of the concerning uses of AI um, you know, around upcoming elections. Um, earlier than we're facing today. Mm. Do you think AI would just help us understand each other more globally? Like, um, and then, and I don't know, just maybe reduce the, the level of uh, war in the, around the world? Or like, because we really understand, we've got all this data about each other, we know each other really well, or is it going to create more conflict? <laughs> <laughs> I'm positive by nature. Yeah. I think even just removing barriers around language is yeah. incredible. Because on my trip to Korea, it's pretty tough to navigate around there still. Translation in real time capabilities yeah. remove a lot of barriers. Um, confusion with language. Uh, you know, it's still going to be challenging in some respects, but I think it does 
hold a lot of opportunity there for misunderstandings and some basic possibilities with better collaboration and better communication. Um, obviously, we have some serious challenges <laughs> in the world, um, but I have hope that AI for good is possible. And there are incredible things happening in the world around the use of AI to empower people who just haven't had healthcare education. Yep. I think it holds great possibilities for yep. the world. hundred percent. This is your $1 billion question now. <laughs> what is next? What do you see next for this industry? For technology? I think technology has the mission to help every organization because every organization is effectively becoming a technology company. Every organization has heartbeat around people and data. And many organizations today are not technology organizations. <laughs> so technology can help there. I also think we're going to see an evolution of the value of skills that are less involved with the technology day to day. Yep hairdressers, artists, um, the human touch, giving more time and empowerment for those careers. I think it's, that's going to be interesting to watch as well. I think authenticity and true human touch is going to be more important than ever. Yeah. And how can technology play a role to empower there so that we can actually have more access to better quality healthcare, more quality time with the doctor um so it's all about using our time in a in the best optimum way yeah yeah i mean my hope is we can have more of an authentic human experience mm -hmm. because we're going to have greater productivity with the mundane now how that comes together is going to be what technology governments and organizations need to do collectively at a local country and global level yeah. Look, technology on its own, it's fantastic. And it comes with uh, something that we call social media. Now, <laughs> you can never hide these days. It doesn't matter. They track you everywhere. What is your view on social media overall? Are you active on social media? I'm active on social media from a business perspective. Yeah. LinkedIn is an invaluable tool. Uh, there's some other mediums I'm not as... Uh, bought off on, we'll say, are as effective. They can come across as quite a bit of noise. And I'm active in a very closed forum. In why is that? Media. Well, why did, is it your choice or like, oh, you don't, you didn't have the chance to expand your viewers or your uh, followers? I would say something like X, formerly known as Twitter. I just find that real time communication, a lot of noise. Right. I really enjoy when someone's taken the time to reflect and they share. And Do they have time this years? I don't think so. Yeah, that real-time communication, I guess I've never really had the time to navigate through the noise as much as some of the other mediums yeah. um, myself. It's not to say I'm not willing to explore that if I feel that's valuable. I think, I think I, you got to pick your bets on the social media channels you feel have yeah. the greatest impact and who you're following. There is just so much news and information to navigate through. So the biggest challenge is your time and what you're going to dedicate to it. AI is playing a role there. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, so what worries me more is around other forms of social media, mental health, and people more vulnerable, particularly young teenage girls. Uh, I think that is an area that is challenging for parents and younger people. Um, so my views on social media are we need to be very careful about it in our personal lives. Mm -hmm. uh, I think as a business tool, having a plan and thinking about how you're going to leverage these incredible channels. It's absolutely essential in our careers for everyone. Do you follow your kids or their activities, their social? Um, yeah, my kids are kind of funny. They're, they were 
in the social media stage fairly early on and so they the natural they adaptive. learned a few lessons and i would say they're they're pretty private uh and what they share and they have very closed communities and they're probably leveraging a few mediums i don't even follow mm. so uh, but those mediums they use again they're pretty deliberate about who they share with yeah so can you offer this there is not to, to have the choice not to follow stuff or you really you have to follow everything just in case you miss on something. How, how does it work these days? I think I'm deliberate. I can't be in the world of I don't know what I don't know. I don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do have the curiosity to look and try to discover new things. But there is just so much so many. out there. Yeah. It's just picking your battles and who you're going to follow and what you're going to trust as your sources. Excellent. Excellent. Look, um, I think your journey has been a fantastic journey so far. Um, one of the most important questions that always I would think I was thinking about over the last few days is you as an executive um, of an American background who lives in Australia, uh, what really attracts you to Australia? Why isn't it the other way around? Why? Look, I think we live in one of the most incredible nations in the world for focus on lifestyle. You know, this, in terms of business culture, I see is very outcome driven. And if you can't get your work done and you're not spending that time on your health and your family, I think there are probably some judgments in the workplace of like, why can't you get your work done? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, an acceptance and a willingness to know that if you're getting that time in for your fitness and your health, you're going to come into work and you're going to offer more to the team. I feel like that is a part of our culture mm -hmm. that I don't see as much in the U.S., yeah. quite frankly. And the polarization in the U.S., it's, it's actually tough to be around and see. I think here, whilst there... Our concerns around politics and polarization, I feel it's pretty grounded. And we're a country of first generation immigrants. Something mm. like I believe 40% of all Australians are born overseas. I love the diversity here and the thinking. And we've all come here to have a better lives for ourselves and our family. And we're bringing unique skills in. So I think it's a great test bed in the world. And not to mention, we're, we're far away. We've got to innovate. Yeah. And we're in a beautiful place. So I think we're very lucky. Uh, that being said, I'm fortunate enough to be able to leave when I want and travel. And that's important too. Yeah. So for now, I think this is an amazing place to be in the world. Love to see more diversification investment from the government and technology and, and skills. Uh, but I feel really fortunate to live in this place of the world. So is Australia like a small hub around somewhere around the globe or and is it like it, it's always the hidden island somewhere from a technology perspective globally? So if, if I take you out and just now I'm interviewing you, you're sitting in the States somewhere and I'm asking you, what is Australia really from a global of you how do you position this country uh, yeah i would say it's like an odd combination <laughs> of innovation and fast follower not necessarily an early adopter with consistency <laughs> somewhat risk averse but pockets of innovation and a great uh sandbox for test and learn uh, but you do have a number of people here who have had careers overseas yeah and uh, are willing to try and test new things. I think it's a matter of getting the right team together in the right environment and a great appetite for fast followers. Um, but you're going to come across some objections. I mm. think you've got to be willing to put your case forward here and know that the leadership here has often had a very broad-based career uh, versus in Europe and Australia, you get a lot of in-depth specialization. So people here can operate across many things. Yeah. <laughs> across many things. 
and so, they claim to be expert in everything yeah, it's regardless. Like, it's not going to be easy to try something new, but if you are successful, there's great possibilities because you're not going into an environment where it's going to be easy, we'll say. Um, but yeah, just sort of an odd combination of great business acumen and maturity, but yet not always leading the world, but in pockets we are. So I think it is what you make of it and understanding yeah. how to navigate our business world and environment. Excellent. So do you vote in general? Do you get involved? Uh, do you have a say overall? And in... Absolutely, I vote. Well, as you know, it's mandatory vote here, which I think is great a great thing mm -hmm. because the middle is represented, the moderate is represented here. And I'm passionate about voting as an American abroad because it worries me about the future of the country. And I think voting is absolutely critical and it's not mandatory vote there. So yeah. it's very important for everyone to vote there and be educated with what's happening. Excellent. So you've, we've got the election coming up yes. in 2024, which is we're all looking for this stage. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad I'm here right now. I'm not sure I'd want to be living in the US itself in an election year. I think, I think you did mention a very good statement before that technology in, is in every business, it is in every house. Um, we are, to some extent, people who work in technology and IT. We are influencers. Are we doing enough to have our voice raised? in changing the political view around the globe. Do we get involved with this stuff? Should we get more involved and have more human exposure rather than just focusing into our bubble and what we do well and, and expand a bit more? I think, it, I think it's important we get involved so that we can make a difference with the resources and the learnings that we've had from technology and most large technology companies like Salesforce, like Microsoft are heavily invested in ESG and sustainability and have made that a priority. And that's very important to share with the world in thinking about how to approach elections and having that focus. And we also offer incredible capabilities with technology to make sure that technology is not used for bad, you know, in manipulating with some of these bots and campaigns that mm -hmm. we're probably going to see uh, happen. Uh, coming into the U.S. election. So I think behind the scenes, these companies will be offering help. Yeah. And that will become very important. But you know, as a citizen, I think it's just important to make sure everyone is educating themselves. They're getting that diverse view that they're not getting into that echo chamber. And we can all be great examples in our community uh, around the importance of voting in the U.S. in particular. Yep, 100%. Marcella Larson, what is your secret? What is the secret <laughs> of your success? <laughs> I'm not sure I have a secret, but I think it's remaining curious, being true to yourself, working with great people. I've caught up with a lot of them in the last couple of weeks, and it's not so much the industry or even the company, it's the people you work with and maintaining those relationships and being willing to take risks to go after what you really want and knowing that only you have the power to build the life you want. Do you follow up your heart in this or what your brain tells you to do? I might follow my heart too much, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I think that's important to, for happiness and being true to life. Uh, so I think it's, it's understanding what you want and having that plan around how to go after it. And having some mechanisms in place, maybe they're people, to hold you accountable as well. <laughs> Look, it was a pleasure having you on this platform. It was a, my personal pleasure to meet you. As a final note, what is your final message to our viewers, especially those young people who are starting a career in IT? What is your advice to them? Go after your passions. If where you're starting in IT 
doesn't excite you, know there's other exciting paths you can pursue in these technology companies. To give back where you can, I think I've always, in the larger corporates, uh, loved the platform it gave me to be on boards, to work with the community, to be able to rally around and do donations with the programs, just to look beyond your day-to-day and know that there's a rich career ahead and to explore many avenues. Don't get locked into one journey on your career. Get a mentor early on. I think would be my biggest thing. And don't be afraid to ask for sponsorship. I didn't do that early enough. That's probably my one regret. I would say I only realized that in a lot of part of my career, how important executive sponsorship is. And keep it real with your family. Let them know they need to be able to tell you when you're losing focus on what's important. Marcelo Larson, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. What was your experience with Brands Flat? Refreshing, actually. It was uh, enjoyable to kind of mix up and think about tech careers, living your best life, but getting behind the scenes. So I would love to look at a number of your other interviews and hear what other people had to say about their journey. Would you recommend Brands Flat to other guests? Well, and as you know, I already have like three or four amazing <laughs> women that I would love to see you interview because I want to hear what they have to say. Excellent. And I admire them. So. Excellent. I look forward for this. Um, I think we so often read about people's profiles and careers and we don't understand the reality behind the scenes. In the pursuit of success and growth, motivations often vary among individuals, with many being driven by the desire for financial prosperity and the opportunity to elevate their social standing. However, Marcella's story serves as a compelling reminder that there exists a different kind of wealth, one that cannot be purchased with money alone. It's a wealth of curiosity, knowledge, and a passion for continuous learning that extends beyond the financial realm. Until next time, take care. I've joined the world Where's of startups. Where's Marcella Larson been incredibly now? incredibly exciting as well as humbling. But in my past, I saw a gap in the market in the past couple of years around better using data to drive growth in uh, the business, particularly in retail and consumer goods and having a future looking metric for customer lifetime value and understanding how to make every customer profitable. And it unleashes a world of possibilities truly when you come in and you have that discussion and you unite the CFO and the CMO and the C-level suite. So it brings forth all sorts of possibilities around customer experience and technology investments and doing it in a refreshing way. I'm going to help you overcome. Previously on Brain Splat. That's, that's, that's something I don't have an answer to. But if you've got more women in tech, then it becomes a bigger problem that people take more notice of. I was earning more money than most graduates after... But is it all about money? Gun in itself can be dangerous or it can be protective. But if the person holding the gun has ill intent, your perception was how can this person really be a leader in technology when they're not technical and they... Tell me something. Would, do you think AI would just make people smarter? Then you're going to end up with some really dangerous and scary outcomes. And so it's very, again... Yeah, but you know, what do you do? Do you li- do you box yourself and live in fear? That doesn't stuff while I was studying, and then there were all these guys going upstairs. Everyone will be scared because but, you know, you would know the answer for the future. Yeah, but you know, I was grumpy with the kids, and he was just like, "We want Emma money. back. We yeah, want, we want Emma, Emma back. back." That would probably be my advice: keep an awareness of that. Don't push yourself because it's ultimately not worth it. Really. But being on a podcast is, is fantastic. So I think you're doing better than a lot of people. <laughs> Trust me. Yes, we have robots coming to market that buy a coffee from a robot yourself. Well, I think what's hold holds most of us back in uh, taking action. Technology sometimes is, is is dumbing people down. Social media gives you a a broader audience, definitely. Um, you know, but how many times have detailed conversations about how people's productivity is affected by drones in the US. And there's one in Dubai as well, they're prototypes. And look, if the market was ready for it, you take out the human experience and replace that with a robot, 
what is your message to those farmers in Colombia, in Africa, in... Hybridizing technology with people, I think is going to fall over, but most importantly is you've got to know how to get back up. So we do all that and with technology, you know, farmers now they can... So really, what's the way forward for you guys in this industry? Right.